I hope you all can hear us. Welcome to uh, our fourth ever Conway Hall in quarantine uh, event. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, Conway Hall is a charity. Uh, our charitable aim is to bring uh, philosophical, ethical and uh, humanist, also uh, other rational and compassionate ideas to the public. Um, and our event, and we rely greatly on events. Um, with, with the lockdown, obviously, we are now currently coming from our shed, my shed. This, this isn't Conway Hall's shed, this is my shed, so this is the Conway. Um, and uh, we're broadcasting from across the internet. Fortunately, we've been able to bring new, this has helped us, assisted us in bringing new speakers. So uh, I'm really, really pleased and happy and excited to uh, introduce Kathy Sullivan. Um, Kathy she is an astronaut. Um, she is the first woman ever to walk in space and has uh, um, worked on three space shuttle missions. She's going to give a, a short talk, about 45 minutes, uh, and then we will open up people's microphones to anyone who has questions. So, um, do please welcome, uh, sharing her screen in a very short moment, uh, do please welcome Kathy Sullivan. Hello, Hi, everybody. Kathy. Hi, Scott. Pleasure to be with you all from uh, over here in Columbus, Ohio, in the USA. Um, as Scott mentioned, I had the privilege of flying on three different space shuttle flights. A little detail that he did not mention is that today is a very, very special day for me because 30 years ago today, instead of sitting in my kitchen doing Zoom talks on my computer, I was strapped into the space shuttle Discovery on a launch pad in Florida uh, and about to head off on the mission that launched the Hubble Space Telescope. So what I'd like to do mainly today is tell you a bit about that flight uh, and a bit about uh, a book that's out just now, if we can get it into focus here, that I've written. Um, this book is both my memoir, it carries up through all of my flights and my years at NASA, but as importantly, I meant it also to be a memoir about the Hubble Telescope itself and some, a small group of really super important but utterly unsung and overlooked engineers. It's their work that is the reason that Hubble is still alive and kicking and doing great astronomy today, 30 years after liftoff. Um, all the more remarkable when you consider that the promise that the engineers made about Hubble was only that it would last 15 years. So it's not only carried on and operating for twice the promised lifetime, but it is a radically better instrument today than it was when we put it into space 30 years ago uh, because of the ability to maintain it on orbit that those engineers designed into the architecture of the telescope itself and then also fashioned into very specialized tools and equipment that astronauts could use to repair it in space. So I'm going to share uh, some images with you as well as we go through this talk. Uh, let's start with these here a click or two. Um, and I want to open by taking you to this exact day 30 years ago in Florida. So here you are. Here's what was happening. This was actually much earlier in the morning than we are at right now. But otherwise, here we are 30 years ago this very day. April 24th, 1990 found us right back where we had been 14 days earlier, suited up, strapped in, and ready to go, with the countdown clock stopped at T minus 31 seconds, again. This time, the Launch Control Center computers had halted the countdown because of an indication that one valve on a pipe used to fill the external fuel tank had failed to close. If the indicator was correct, then only one more valve was left to prevent the fuel in our tank from leaking overboard instead of feeding into the shuttle's three main engines. If that happened, we could end up too low to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope, or at an abort landing site on the other side of the Atlantic, or even splashed into the ocean. The launch would be scrubbed rather than accept that risk. If the indicator was wrong, however, think about the flaky tire pressure sensor in your car, then the engine system was fine and there was no reason to scrub. Which was it? Serious problem or faulty indicator? 
go for launch or scrub. This high stakes call fell to the launch team controller responsible for the shuttle's main propulsion system, someone I still know only by his call sign, MPS. Time was not on this guy's side. The shuttle's auxiliary power units set a strict limit on how much longer we could hold at this point, just 12 minutes more. In the cockpit, we listened intently as the launch team worked out the problem. MPS, what's your status? The launch director asked. The propulsion engineer talked calmly through the data on his display. The temperature and pressure readings in the surrounding lines were not consistent with an open valve. Fundamental physics said it was closed. He proposed to send a repeat command, hoping this would make the indicator read properly. That worked, but the control center computers still had a lock on the countdown clock. MPS, what's your call? The launch director pressed. I am prepared to manually override the software and proceed with the count, he replied. With a crisp and rapid cadence the best soldier would envy, the launch director gave him the go to do that and told the other controllers to get ready to continue the countdown. The call we had been hoping for came a split second later. All controllers, this is NTD. The countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. The entire episode had taken less than three minutes. 31 seconds later, Discovery roared off the launch pad. Sitting on the lower deck with nothing but a wall of storage lockers to look at, I closed my eyes and took in the sounds and sensations of a space shuttle launch. The solid rocket motors, which are essentially gigantic firecrackers, made the first two minutes and 15 seconds turbulent and loud. I felt like I was in an earthquake and a fighter jet at the same time. The vibrations were almost bone rattling, the thrust pushing through my back, strong and constant. I felt the thrust tailing off just before Charlie announced that the solid rockets were burning out then heard the thump that confirmed they had been jettisoned. The ride was much quieter now and as smooth as an electric train. The push against my back continued as our main engines accelerated us towards orbital velocity. Six minutes later, they cut off as planned. The lightness in my arms, the checklist dangling at the ends of their tethers, announced that we were in orbit. Although nearly six years had passed since my first space flight, I felt instantly at home. So that's how I spent my April 24th, 30 years ago. But of course, uh, it was a long road uh, getting to that point. And I tell about that long road, uh, my girlhood, girls school years and on into my college and graduate school years. Uh, and then be the fun and challenge of becoming an astronaut uh, as it turns out, I joined the NASA Astronaut Corps immediately after finishing my PhD. So the interview to become an astronaut was my very first ever job interview. And astronaut was my first ever full-time job, which is a really stunning thing to think about as I look back now. My first flight, uh, as mentioned in the close of the prologue, my first flight was six years before the Hubble flight, 1984. And you see an image here from launch day on that mission. And I'm sure all of you are looking at this picture right now saying, wow, that's really cool. There they are waiting to get in the shuttle, synchronizing their watches. Um, just what you would expect to see happening before a big event like a space shuttle mission, right? Well, that's not actually what was happening here. Um, that's me on the left and Sally Ride on the right. Uh, and we are indeed in the little vestibule that's just outside the space shuttle the black bit behind Sally over her uh, shoulder to, in the far upper right corner, that's actually the side of the space shuttle itself. And you can see the metal rim of the hatch. It just so happened that uh, the seating arrangements in the cockpit meant we would be the last two astronauts to get aboard. Uh, so here we are standing around, frankly, sort of aimlessly for several minutes. Uh, the famous, very famous first American woman to fly in space on the right, and the soon to be famous first American woman to do a spacewalk on the left. 
and after a couple of minutes, we began to feel sort of awkward just standing there having nothing to do. Uh, so we looked sideways at each other and said, this is feeling rather awkward. We, we should probably look as if we are doing something important. Uh, and the idea flashed through both of our minds at the same time. Well, let's pretend we're synchronizing our watches. I mean, they always synchronize watches before a big event in the movies, so we can do ours. So we're actually pretending here to synchronize our watches. And as we're chatting together, we're, we're not saying anything about the time that's shown on our wrists. We're wondering, we're wondering what the news anchors are saying uh, about the scene that they are seeing. And we're wondering how long we can carry this on uh, without our, our little stunt itself starting to look uh, too foolish for words. The, the bookend to this story from the launch pad is that when we returned from this flight seven days later, our colleagues had saved up a lot of the press coverage uh, from the event. And sure enough, this image figured prominently on the front page of many, many newspapers in the United States. And sure enough, you know, we couldn't have asked for this to turn out any better. Uh, essentially every single caption read in very momentous tones, Sal Kathy Sullivan and Sally Ride synchronized their watches before boarding the space shuttle Challenger. So we were absolutely thrilled that our little, our little stunt had an impact far beyond filling the moments before we got into the spacecraft. Uh, I landed from this flight in October of 84, and uh, by the end of the year, well, might have been very early 1985, uh, was assigned with, along with fellow astronaut Bruce McCandless, to be the two spacewalkers on the flight that would put the Hubble Space Telescope into orbit. Uh, when we were assigned, that was meant to be in late 1986. Uh, but of course, as events turned out, uh, and specifically the tragic loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger in January of 1986, the Hubble launch slipped down the schedule uh, until it ended up in April of 1990. But we, Bruce and I were assigned to Hubble earlier than usual because of the maintenance requirement. Uh, the telescope, as I alluded to, had been given an architecture that made it feasible to repair and replace almost all the electronics boxes that make the telescope work and all the scientific instruments that make it so valuable. But the actual tools and equipment needed to carry that out uh, were nowhere near ready. They, they'd almost not begun uh, to be designed and worked on. And so that was really the task that occupied Bruce and me for the five years leading up to launch. And we set our task to be ensuring that no astronaut that ever went to Hubble to work on it as a repairman would ever, ever encounter a tool that didn't fit or something they couldn't reach or uh, a flaw in the procedure they were planning to use. They would, they would never get up to Hubble trying to fix something and have to call back to Mission Control and say, hey guys, this doesn't actually work the way you told me it would. So you see um, two examples here. These are both scenes from the large uh, water tanks that we use to simulate weightlessness and practice spacewalks. Uh, I'm the upper astronaut in the scene on the left in the white suit. Bruce is the lower one. And again, on the right as well, I'm the upper one uh, with my feet anchored in that foot restraint and Bruce is below me. What we're doing in the water tanks is not the precision aspect of the task, but it's really mapping out the choreography. Uh, who moves where, when, what steps do you do first? If you've taken out the old electronics unit that's broken, where do you store it temporarily so that you can install the new one? Uh, how long will each of these tasks take, which is critical for all of this uh, pretty sensitive space hardware because it will start to get very cold if it's left exposed to the vacuum of space for very long. So figuring out the geometry, figuring out the choreography between the two spacewalkers so that you're very efficient, very effective. And in the early days, this really was also identifying things we hadn't thought of yet. You get a, a glimpse of that in the picture on the right here, that white bar that I have my left hand on. Uh, that was an idea for where we might have to install a handle on one of the big scientific instruments. We're working there with a, a, a mock-up of a large scientific instrument. It's the right shape and the right size, uh, pretty ac very accurately the right shape and the right size to give us a sense of 
how hard or easy it would be to move it around. But otherwise, it's made of a few pieces of metal and some the kind of mesh you would put on a window screen. Uh, but we're just checking here, uh, where do we have to have handles so that we can lift this thing up, move it around, and, and install it uh, as precisely as required in the telescope. That sounds like a very obvious thing, but remember, uh, build a Hubble telescope and put it into orbit at this point is something that nobody has ever done in the history of the universe. So you have to learn these things the first time and learning by doing or learning by trying and discovery what, what doesn't work uh, is the most efficient way to do that. On the precision end of the task, on the real hardware, and now you're looking at pictures of real bits of Hubble, one of the electronics units on the left, one of the data boxes on the left, uh, with all the connectors that carry the signals in and out, and the, the hinge point of Hubble's solar array on the right. And, and by the way, since I'm speaking either entirely or largely to uh, a, a UK audience, I would note that the picture on the right was taken at the uh, British Aerospace Facilities, um, actually it's taken, I'm sorry, uh, in California uh, at the assembly facility where Hubble was being built, but the silver assembly that you see there is the solar array, uh, one of the two solar arrays, both of which were built at the, Brist at the British Aerospace Facility out by Bristol. Uh, I'm the person in the white bunny suit on the far right of that frame. My crewmate, Bruce, is uh, in the foreground, uh, kneeling down, looking at the wrench. So we had to design on the precision end of things we ended up having to design about 105 uh, unique tools. Some of them were unique in being modifications of everyday household tools that made them workable with the hefty, cumbersome gloves that you wear in a spacesuit. So the wrench I'm using in the scene on the right will look familiar to any of you that ever works on your car or on plumbing or electronics. It's a ratchet wrench. Uh, what's different is the enlarged handle you see my left hand is on the top of that handle. Uh, and the holes in the handle are not just to make the handle lighter, but because they're, you can stick a finger of a spacesuit glove through those holes. So it helps you handle the wrench uh, and spin it when you get down to low running torques. Um, what you can't quite see is that we put a big mushroom cap at the right angle of that wrench because you, you sometimes have to hold on to a ratchet wrench so it it only drives in the direction that you want. And it, wearing a spacesuit, you cannot do that in the way we, we would be familiar with on Earth. You need, you need that large mushroom cap about the size of the palm of my hand uh, right at the top of the wrench to let you do that. The device on the left, the silver device on the left, looks kind of just like some slightly modified pair of pliers. And in some respects, that's exactly what it is. But the particular challenge here was that Hubble has many electronics boxes with SCADs, just loads of big electrical connectors on them. This one, this one only has you know, six. You see two pig caps and the four silver ones. But other boxes had up to 36 connectors, very large connectors, very stiff to, to uh, loosen up or attach, and so closely spaced that even on the ground, it was hard to get um, just a gloved, a latex glove hand uh, in on the connector. And with a spacesuit glove, again, there was no way that you could unfasten these connectors with your gloved hand. We needed a tool that could reach into these tight spaces, uh, that could come down along sort of the pathway of the wires, but it also had to be able to put a tremendous amount of force onto the locking ring of the connector because these are pretty heavy duty industrial connectors that take an awful lot of strength and awful lot of force to, to work loose. So just two examples of the, the kinds of inventions on the left, that's an invented from nothing tool uh, produced uh, in Houston or modifications of tools that might be more familiar every day that had to go into making it possible to repair Hubble. And then in addition to the tools you would actually use on the electronics and boxes, all the other support equipment, uh, just exactly how are you going to carry the new equipment up in the shuttle payload bay? Where is it going to be mounted? Uh, what Are you going to have to open enclosures uh, to get at it? Are they going to be inside protective boxes? Uh, how are you going to lift them out? Uh, where, where are you going to stash 
the old one that you've already removed because probably the old one is going to come home in the same container that the new one came up in. So how are you going to do that, that daisy chain of a dance, old one out, new one in, and so forth? Um, that was also a whole other raft of very substantial support equipment. And then also to think ahead about uh, how will we train astronauts to do this in the future? Bruce and I could train for these tasks by flying out to California where the telescope was being built and doing them on the real telescope with the actual tools that we were going to take to orbit. But we were the last two astronauts that would ever be able to do that. And we were very keenly aware of that. So we were very careful and took great pains to make sure that we captured, we recorded, we noted all the little fine detailed bits of experience that we gained, the little tips of the trade, if you will, that we might otherwise forget to pass on to other shuttle crew members that would eventually fly and work on Hubble. Uh, we also took great pains to bring about a dozen of them out to California with us at different times so that we were not the only two astronauts that ever saw the real telescope on the ground before it went to orbit. It really was investing, we really were committed to investing and in making sure that the NASA team, and in particular the, the larger team of astronauts, really had all of the insight and knowledge and experience that would ensure the astronaut corps could look after Hubble for its entire life. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the planned life at this point in time was 15 years. So we knew we had a 15 year challenge. We were hopeful that Hubble might last for longer than that. Uh, but I can promise you none of us ever imagined uh, that it would really keep going for twice its full lifetime. Well, back to the astronaut part of things. Um, astronauts get to design uh, the emblem for their flights. You see on the left, the one that we designed for the Hubble flight, our mission commander and PLT or pilot, the number two in command, their names are on the top. Um, and the, what we called mission specialists, the engineers that operate do the spacewalks, uh, operate the robotic arm. Uh, the three of us are on the bottom, Steve Hawley, Bruce McCandless, and myself. Uh, and we'd like, we were intrigued with this logo. We wanted something that suggested motion for the uh, space shuttle. Uh, so that sort of swoop from that runs from white to blue to red, uh, that swish, uh, we felt sort of gave a dynamic sense to the patch, uh, but also showed Hubble sort of staying in orbit, staying behind and gazing off into the, the galaxies beyond. Uh, very fun. Well, one of the big evolutions, big exercises you do as you get ready for a spaceflight in the shuttle era is about three weeks before you lift off, you, we all fly down to the Kennedy Space Center. The Launch Control Center at Kennedy is fully manned with all of the engineers that will be on the, the support consoles on launch day. The Mission Control Center in Houston is fully manned. Uh, the Space Telescope Control Facility and all of the other engineering support groups which in this case included Bristol uh, and uh, the British Aerospace team. Everyone, it's a for real 100% dress rehearsal. Everybody's there. The only things different are the solid rockets are not gonna actually light. But you do, we would go through a, a miniature version of our quarantine, living in our crew quarters, all of the updates, all of the briefings, all of the steps that would normally be done leading up to a real launch. And as part of that, something that became a tradition was that the flight crews would have uh, nice little enameled pin versions of their crew emblem made up, uh, some th of the size you would might mount on a suit lapel or maybe use as a tie tack if you're a gentleman. Uh, and we would, in some of the breaks between the testing, we would go visit all the engineers that had gotten the space shuttle ready for launch, that had uh, tested the cargo and installed it in the payload bay, I think you can imagine if there are five people lifting off in a space shuttle, there's literally a team of thousands that has made everything ready for that moment and done everything imaginable to ensure both the safety of the mission and the crew, uh, but also just to ensure everything will go well. And we always, astronauts always feel uh, proud to be able to go around and thank those people for their work uh, and remind them uh, they don't get the flight suit and they don't get the cool ride but their work is every bit as important as anything that we're gonna do on the spaceship. And we know that and respect that. So we had those enamel pins made up for this mission. And someone thought, you know, on the bottom of that, on the bottom outside of the patch, why don't we put a little 
a little crescent, another little band that says launch team. So the people that get this will know that the astronauts themselves came out and gave me this pin. I was on the crew. I was on the ground crew that helped launch Hubble. And we had about a thousand of those pins and you see one of them here. And uh, they're really nicely done, except for that one little minor point on the bottom. Uh, and you know, it, the, the funny thing nowadays is of course, whoever did this design, if they ran spell check on this design, it passed spell check. They spelled lunch correctly. Uh, spell check doesn't know that you meant for there to be an A in that word. Uh, the NASA leadership was of course mortified at this mistake and wanted us to reclaim these pins from all the people to whom we'd given them. And of course, all the people we'd given them to thought they had the coolest collector's item ever known to man in the space program. So uh, this, the picture you see here happens to be one of the few I managed to grab hold of and keep in my own collection because you otherwise, you can't, you can't find these anymore. They're carefully hidden away in favored collections. Well, this is a scene from what my life was like 30 years ago tomorrow. This is just literally moments, probably seconds, after Steve Hawley has maneuvered the shuttle's robotic arm, that's the white soda straw-like thing you see at the center left. He had used that to lift the Hubble telescope up out of the payload bay. We had held it above the cargo bay while engineers on the ground checked everything out and unfolded the solar arrays and so on. Uh, when everything was ready, Steve was given the go-ahead to release the snares, the grapple on the robotic arm, pull the arm away, and just a few moments after this picture was shot, Lauren Shriver would fire the shuttle's maneuvering engines and the space shuttle would back away, sort of disappear out the bottom of this frame, as it were. Uh, this is a very special image to me for another reason. Having spent five years working on Hubble, knowing it basically every inch of the telescope very intimately, and really looking forward to what this day would be like and to how beautiful it would be to see this elegant spacecraft slip away from the space shuttle, I did not in fact get to witness this sight at all. Because the golden solar array you see at the top of the frame uh, had hung up during deployment. It did not unfurl completely. Uh, and that was really a problem because we were draining Hubble's batteries and needed to get both the solar arrays fully deployed before the batteries ran so low that they could not be recovered. So when this picture is taken, Bruce McCandless and I are in our spacesuits inside the space shuttle airlock. Half of the air has been dumped out of the airlock already. We were about to head out on a spacewalk to crank that solar array the rest of the way open by hand with the exact same wrench I showed you a couple of slides ago. That would have been my job. Uh, but just before we got the go ahead to go outside, an engineer on the ground came up with a workaround that solved the problem without a spacewalk. And so if you look at the very bottom of this image, uh, right here, you see that little semicircle. Uh, that's the uh, outside hatch of the shuttle airlock. Just inside of there is a small six foot diameter can with sterile white walls. And Bruce and I are locked in that little can staring at those white walls when this glorious moment happened. So this is the best view I've, I have of Hubble as well. Well, the, you know, the rest of the Hubble story, uh, of course, is largely known. Uh, the large mirror that makes Hubble work to 2.4 meters in diameter uh, was a fatal flaw hidden, hidden inside the telescope itself, just lurking there waiting to bite everybody once we put Hubble into orbit. Uh, it's, it's slightly too flat. It's a concave mirror, but ever so slightly too flat at the outer edge. And by ever so slightly, I mean pluck a piece of hair from your head, slice it into 25 slices. One of those slices is how far off the mirror is. Incredibly minuscule distance to us normal human beings, but a large enough mistake to be devastating to the astronomical capabilities of Hubble. Uh, this became a, a real huge embarrassment and a really existential threat to NASA. And you see some of the things that were written uh, in the aftermath here. Um, but for those of us that had worked on Hubble repair, uh, it quickly turned into a, a better and different story. Uh, because 
clever and the clever engineers that came together to try to figure out what to do about this after they cried in their beer a little bit and threw themselves a bit of a pity party you know then they got together and started trying to figure out okay what can we recover here hubble was still able to do astronomy at this point by the way it still was a telescope that was outside the atmosphere so it still could do some very respectable ultraviolet astronomy but the real bread and butter and the really critical astronomy that was the rationale for the big expense and effort, that's the optical astronomy that now could not be done well enough. Uh, and eventually a clever engineer realized the challenge we face is not fix the mirror. The challenge we face is how do we fix the light? So the big mirror intercepts light. It tries to focus it, but it can't focus it enough. Well, that's very akin to when we have a problem with our own eyes. So the bad news is I we mess, messed up the mirror, but the good news is it was a very precise mistake. And so just like an eye doctor can calculate very precisely, what lens do I put in this frame so that the Kathy Sullivan's eyes get corrected accurate light, that could be done with Hubble as well. If we can get the correction into the inside of the telescope, intercept the bad light, turn it into good light, and voila, all the instruments can work again. And that, of course, is where the maintenance capability really paid its dividends. Uh, one scientific instrument was replaced with a device that carried those optical corrections. And what Hubble could do before that correction is shown on the left, what it could do immediately afterwards in 1993 is shown on the right. And not only that, so, so that's proof point number one. If something is broken or wrong on Hubble, I can go fix it, proof point number one. But the second important point about maintenance is I don't have to leave Hubble frozen in 1970s technology through its entire life. As technology improves, as batteries improve, solar arrays improve, um, data storage improves, data rates improve, and, and detectors and cameras improve, I can continually upgrade Hubble. So this is an image of a, a similar galaxy to the one I just showed you, uh, but taken much more recently with the fourth generation camera now. Uh, it's kind of the difference between an iPhone 4 and an iPhone 11. Uh, it's just Hubble is, has improved dramatically through its life, and in fact is with the exception of the two mirrors and the structure that holds it all together, uh, everything else on the Hubble telescope that's up there today is utterly different than the telescope that we put into orbit uh, back in 1990. So that's the, the story I wanted to tell. And the reason I wrote this book is because of that really inventive, creative, clever uh, engineering that went into making Hubble maintainable. It's a bit counterintuitive in our day and age to connect the words innovation and maintenance, but Hubble is a really great example of how actually they are twins. They are opposite sides of the same coin. The, the innovation, the inventiveness, the cleverness it takes to build a, a novel system like Hubble is one thing, but it takes a similar amount of all of those attributes uh, to develop the, the gadgets, the devices, the tools, the techniques to maintain and sustain and continually improve it through a long and productive lifetime. So a final point before we open up for questions, why did I give the book the title that I did, Handprints on Hubble? Uh, I am a Hubble uh, crew member and a loyal and proud Hubble hugger, as we say. But interestingly, uh, my name is not one that is very widely associated with Hubble anymore. A couple of names of astronauts that did the very dramatic servicing spacewalks tend to be the name, the astronaut names that people will know if they know any of them at all, and in particular, John Grunsfeld. So I had long ago taken the view that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now like that main engine flight controller whose story I told. I'm someone you hadn't heard of or didn't know was involved in this. But at the same time, I definitely have, I had a hand in everything that Hubble has done. I feel like I have a handprint or a fingerprint on every discovery that Hubble has made because of the contributions, the small contributions that I made to the effort. And I was, I discovered as I was doing my research for the book, 
that there are actual handprints now on the outside of Hubble because astronauts have spacewalked all over it and repaired and replaced so many things. And John Grunsfeld, one of those astronauts, uh, one of the astronauts whose name is very much associated with Hubble nowadays, he took this picture as he was leaving Hubble for the last time on the last servicing mission. And all the dark marks you see here are, are the scuff marks, the handprints that the spacesuits and gloves of spacewalking astronauts have left on the outside of Hubble. So I had spoken for years metaphorically about the handprint that I feel I have on Hubble and all that it's done and was delighted to learn there are now actual handprints on Hubble and they, are let, they were left there by the maintainers, the astronauts that built on, worked with, used, and then improved and extended the maintenance capability, the tools and the equipment that we, we worked together to create from 1985 to 1990. You'll not only get my story in this book, but um, by name, a half a dozen of the engineers, I call them the hidden figures of the Hubble story. Uh, they're the guys that invented that odd set of flyers. There's, they're the people who figured out with us the choreography of the spacewalks. Uh, tools, equipment, toolboxes, foot restraints that are still in use today all over the International Space Station that were created by this group of engineers. First, first to take care of Hubble, but then have gone on to serve many other purposes. Uh, their names have never been mentioned and their story and their contribution to what Hubble is and has done had never been told before. And I really wrote this book to set that record straight and give them their due. So with that, let me uh, give the screen back to our hosts and uh, shift gears and let's go into some questions, Scott. Hello, thanks, Kathy. That was that was brilliant. We do have uh, four questions at the moment. Um, we have about half an hour for questions, I think. Um, Great. And uh, our first question is from Emma, page eleven. I'm just going to uh, open up the mic, and we can have the question. Hi. Um, which was your favourite mission, and why? Oh, um, it's an impossible question, Emma. I mean, you know, they're all so unique and different. My, the, my favorite impression of my first mission is just the newness of everything. You know, experiencing it all for the very first time is just a sparkling experience. Uh, Hubble stands out as a favorite because it was so special to be part of something that we knew would be, we knew would be so historic. Uh, I, I think we all underestimated how really revolutionary and productive Hubble has been in the end. But, but even with that underestimated estimate, uh, we knew we were part of something that was going to be really historically momentous. Uh, and then my third one, uh, I had a leadership role on my third flight and the crew was very, very simpatico. And I was now sort of the experienced old hand. So my third flight gave me the pleasure of having a space flight really feel very familiar. Um, if you really push me and make me choose, I will pick Hubble because of what I said. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. And the next question is Haley Dunning. Haley, I hope you're ready. Yes, hello. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that talk. It strikes me that you and Bruce have a lot of experience and knowledge that only you had. So did you have like a backup person in case one of you couldn't fly? Uh, in the, we did not use backups in the shuttle program. Uh, there was a little more, rather more interchangeability. For our flight, there were about six things that could go wrong uh, as we were deploying Hubble, and we would only have done a spacewalk for one of those six things. Uh, if the solar ray is not unfolding properly, as I mentioned, there were two antennas that had to deploy correctly. Uh, the, the, the lens cap basically needed to unlock successfully, uh, uh, the power umbilical had to drop. And those, so we were ready for those six tasks and trained to a very high degree for them. Uh, but those were ones that are pretty straightforward. If someone else had had to swap in for me or for Bruce, it would have been a pretty short learning curve uh, to get them ready to do just those six tasks. A diff more difficult problem when you get into the, the uh, four and five spacewalk um, 
missions that the surfacing uh, missions represented. And there you had two sets of spacewalkers because, so they could alternate days. And you would have been able to have one of them back up someone who got sick or had a problem uh, along the way. Thank you. Okay, Mirren, I'm gonna open up your uh, microphone. Hi, um, thanks again for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, if you've had to redo your mission to take the Hubble into space for the first time, is there anything you would do differently, preparation-wise or while actually in space? Um, I think from, a, from our point of view on the flight crew, uh, the preparations that we went through uh, served us really very well. The, I can think of only one, one glitch that was at all a bit of a surprise, and that just had to do with the fact that the the simulations, the computer generated simulations we trained in on the ground uh, about lifting Hubble up out of the cargo bay with the robot arm, they, they always made it move very, very smoothly. Uh, and in, in practice, as Steve began to maneuver the telescope in flight, it, it had just a bit of a slow wobble to it, which was kind of terrifying because there was only about this much room between the telescope and the side of the space shuttle. Uh, but, you know, that just, that just fit in the category that we know very well, which is all models are wrong, but some are useful. And all simulations are wrong in some respect or another. The, you just have to hope they're not so wrong that they badly mislead you. I think the, uh, the team on the ground that was charged with flight control of Hubble itself um, probably would have been good if we'd been able to put them through a few more very stressful simulations. They, it's a very complex spacecraft and they clearly were struggling in the first hours as we were deploying it. They were clearly struggling to uh, keep up to speed with the telescope and, and operate and move fast enough to let the deployment go on time. Oh, interesting, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next, next question goes to Graham Taylor. Graham, how are you doing? Hi there, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question is, is space exploitation. I wondered how long it will take um, to go to planet Mars. How long, how long away we are from actually touching Mars. And if there's any planet explorations getting ready to go to Mars in the next few years. Um, there are a number of uh, missions that are being prepared to go to Mars in the 2020, I think it's 21, might be 23 yes. launch window. I should, I should know that date better. Sorry. But there, wow. um, the, the, the trick about going to Mars is to look for those particular geometries of the Sun and Earth and Mars that uh, allow you to you take an orbit that is on the order of six months to get there. That's the fast way. Uh, and there is one of those windows coming up, as I said, in, I think, 2021. Uh, so there are at least a half a dozen. All, these would be all robotic missions at this point. Uh, and there are you know, a number of uh, efforts underway, some in the private sector and some in other national programs uh, that are thinking ahead about mounting uh, missions to Mars with humans, uh, probably somewhere more in the 2030 timeframe. Wow, that's fantastic. And do you think, do you think um, uh, they'll, they'll put some more space probes on, on the rest of the planets just, just to, just to um, speculate on what's on their planet surface? Well, the point of a probe, of course, is that you go past speculating, and you get some data that helps uh, narrow down the range of speculations. And yes, there, uh, there do continue to be uh, space probe efforts, again, in European Space Agency, uh, Japanese, the, the United States, uh, India is uh, doing some of that, China and Russia as well. Um, so the, the, sat the moons of Jupiter are a particular point of interest right now, Europa uh, in particular, uh, and Titan at Saturn. So I, I think you'll see several of those coming along. And there every now and then is talk of trying to put a probe onto either Venus or Mercury. The surfaces of those planets are just so incredibly hot that um, if you manage to get the probe to land at all, it's likely not going to live for very long before it just gets you know, baked to death. So we're going to go to John. Can you hear me now? Sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry. Oh, hi. Uh, there we go. Hi, sorry. To, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I was just wondering, there was, I had two quick questions, hopefully. You, you, um, I assume there was no issues with the spacesuit sizes that we, like, we had recently um, for, for the females on your team when you went out 30 years ago. 
Yeah, so, uh, I mean, no, there wasn't, uh, which is largely a question of the fact that the inventory of, of spacesuit parts that NASA could assemble into suits was larger back then. Uh, the, the, no, no shuttle astronaut has ever been fitted personally, uh, tailor fitted with a spacesuit. It's a, I call it a Mr. Potato Head suit. They, they make arm sections in different lengths and leg sections in different lengths and they, they choose which of those segments to put together into your spacesuit based on your body measurements. So the, the spacesuit that's used today, the American spacesuit that's used today on the station, same one I used, uh, it never fits anybody really exactly perfectly right, uh, but it is a, a greater disadvantage for smaller framed people um, than for larger limbed people. That's just the basic physics of levers. A longer arm gives you a longer moment arm and it takes less force to move the suit around than if you have short limbs. Okay, so next we have uh, John. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, John. Great. Um, first of all, I have to say I, I grew up partly in the 1980s in Florida. So the, the launches and the space shuttle, I mean, is, has a nostalgic uh, quality for me. And um, the, the photos you showed kind of evoke that. So thank you. Great. Um, I have just a general question. Um, how do you feel about the kind of general direction of the, the space program now as it stands? And do you feel that NASA as you know, um, as a department still has, um, as an agency, uh, still has the support that it, uh, it once had? So those are the general questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it does still have very strong popular support in the United States. Um, and I would say overall it has good uh, political and budget support. I mean, its budget is substantially larger now than, uh, than it was when I was there. Um, it's, I, most of what NASA most of what the space part of NASA has suffered with it through the years is, uh, you know, lack lack of agreed upon focus of what it should do. Uh, so you you know everyone wants NASA to be a leader and the United States to take leading roles and be innovative in space. So you get you know eighty percent of people will agree with statements like that. But then you take the next question and say, well, what exactly did you mean that? It ought, NASA ought to do, and that's where opinion fractures, and there'll be go to go to Mars, go to the moon, go all robotic. Uh, so it's been hard to get the kind of political focus, sustained political focus, uh, on on an agreed set of objectives that it would really take to move along. Uh, either either building, either establishing a presence on the moon or going to Mars uh, is going to be you know a decadal a decadal long undertaking, uh, and it, it will it will be more than a decade or it will never ever happen if you're sort of on again off again on again off again every three to five years so it, the program the agency has suffered from that uh volatility in its assigned goals uh next question goes to samira um thank you for a really inspirational talk um, i'm one of that generation who grew up watching the shuttle program from the beginning. And I remember going to um, um, the Kennedy Space Center just before it was being launched and everyone talked about it as the step to, you know, deeper space manned missions. By the time of Hubble, of course, we realized that the technology could achieve so much. And I wonder what you feel is the future of manned missions and what astronauts talk about. Because we look at the likes of Elon Musk making these grand promises and, and a lot of us are quite skeptical. Yeah, um, I, 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 I'm a both and person. I don't think it's uh, either or for robotic or human. Uh, I think there's a synergy and an interplay between human presence and robotic capabilities that we ought to be, you ought to be looking at it in that way as an optimizing problem rather than as a, a competitive, you know, which one problem. Um, I, I, there, robots can do, if you, if all you need is data about uh, properties you already know you want to measure or questions you already know to ask. Uh, robots can get you data, uh, but they, they certainly are not yet, and I don't think they'll ever fully be, as creatively adaptive uh, to the unknown and the unexpected as, as humans are. So you know, 
that that's point one that I would make in terms of why there always is going to want to be some intelligent, creative uh, blend and partnership between the two. Um, my point number two is this is fundamentally a human quest, a human undertaking, and that to sustain any human quest or undertaking requires some motivation and some passion. And as you know, pundits like Neil Tyson have said to sum this line of argument up, um, there'll never be a ticker tape parade for a robot. There is something mm -hmm. about us going there. There is something that has a different appeal and inspiration and motivation to all, to all of us who don't go uh, that one of us went on our behalf as opposed to I sent my gadget there and I have some data. Thank you so much. Okay, Len, uh, I think you're up next. Hi. Len, we can't hear you. Oh, hi. Can you hear me now? We can. Yep. Okay. Oh, hi, Kathy, and thank you very much for a really interesting uh, talk. I had two very quick questions. Uh, clearly, Bubble's done some amazing things in its years. You may not have expected that maybe when you first went up there to launch it. Um, what's your favourite image? I mean, there's some amazing images in the last few years. And discoveries, of course, of some of the oldest galaxies um, going way back to... 13 billion years back, something like that. Um, yeah, so very simple question. I just thought, you know, have you a headline discovery or image that you'd like to share with us? Um, I, well, I don't have any particular images queued up at the moment, so I won't be able to, you know, plop one up and screen share, but uh, I'm a galaxy gal, so I really love all the different, um, all the different images of galaxies uh, that it, Hubble's been able to create uh, just you know, they're, they're, they are works of art. I mean, just really remarkable. Um, that favorite discovery, uh, boy, way too many for me to list, uh, but I'm also sort of a planets person. So I've been quite, I've quite liked the fact that Hubble has let us mo monitor seasons on other planets in the solar system. I mean, you know, Hubble looking at Jupiter and Saturn is a, it's a, it's, it's almost as good as a, an, a probe, a planetary probe that's part way out to the planet. It's a, it's a great view. Uh, we've watched the great spot of Jupiter evolve and understand the storminess in Jupiter's atmosphere, certainly better now than we did before. Uh, partly that's do, down to Hubble because, because Hubble can watch over time, which uh, mostly planetary probes can't do. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, next question goes to Dickie. Vicky, I'm going to open your mic. Hi. Um, can I ask, what is your favorite tool that was engineered for Hubble? Ah, um, but my favorite tool of the ones that we built is that um, connector tool that I showed you, because uh, it, uh, it was one of the ones that I was very intimately and directly involved with the tool designer. So I, I lived the whole thing from that moment standing out standing alongside the Hubble telescope in its assembly facility with Bruce, with this tool designer named Michael Withy, uh, looking at the, this dense forest of really difficult connectors and brainstorming together, the three of us, well, well, what would we need? How would we do that? And coming up with this idea of the right angle jaw and, and brainstorming, you know, what, what kind of material I, I, I need something that will be able to grip on these rings, but not grate any of the metal. I don't want to create metal filings. You know, what kind of synthetic plastic or Teflon or rubber compound? And so I, I, it was fun for me to get to be part of all of the brainstorming of that particular tool. And then also in the loop as we took it back out to the Hubble and, and tested it and practiced with it. And it, it took us you won't be surprised to know that we didn't get the right idea the first time. We went out with uh, one of Michael's tools that we thought would work, and it, you know, it, it absolutely didn't work. It, it could not transmit enough force onto the connector. The, the jaw sort of splayed out when we gripped it really hard instead of gripping more tightly, and the, the um, compound that we put on the jaw to let it grip well just came right out. So the one I showed you the picture of was about the third, the third version of that. Thank you. Yeah, and the next question is first to Nicola. Hi, Hi Nicola. Hello. Hello, Nicola. 
we hear you. Oh, hi. So, sorry, you might have answered this a couple of questions ago. Um, I was going to ask, can you tell us some of the things that the Hubble telescope found or discovered since it was launched? Oh, I can, I'll put my finger on just a couple. There's actually lots of stuff around on the internet right now because this is the anniversary uh, doing sort of the greatest hit summary of that. Um, uh, but be, because it can look so far back in time, so far uh, out into space, it's been able to very much refine uh, the Hubble constant, which is a critical parameter that tells us whether the universe is uh, expanding or contracting. Uh, it's, it's gotten, it's tightened that down to much better than the performance target r really was. Um, I guess one of my favorite ones is that before Hubble, you know, black holes were thought to be very exotic objects that were associated with certain quasars, but sort of strange, strange exotic objects, probably kind of rare in the cosmos. And Hubble has helped us realize that uh, there is a black hole at the center of virtually every major galaxy. Uh, and then finally, uh, and it's an it, image I do like to show very often, uh, the Hubble astronomers did an experiment one time, which was to point the telescope at a patch of the sky that as far as they knew from existing instruments uh, was empty. So, you know, let's, it sure looks empty from all the other telescopes we have. So let's see if, what Hubble sees. So they pointed Hubble at this small patch of sky and they let it stare for a very long time. Uh, and what came out were images that are called the Hubble Deep Field. You can look them up on the internet. But what's, what's remarkable about the images that came back is it's a whole frame that's just completely full of points of light where you thought the sky was empty. Mm -hmm. And what's more remarkable still, if you enlarge the image a bit and zoom in on it, is all of the points of light are galaxies, not stars. So thousands and thousands of Milky Ways in a patch of the sky that we thought was empty. That's just stunning to me. Wow. <coughs> Thank you. That's really interesting. Okay. Uh, John has the next question. John, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah, another quick question. I, I just uh, a basic question about the images that we see from Hubble. Um, I've always wondered to what extent are they enhanced after the fact, or can we take at least many of those images as kind of pure photos of what Hubble sees, or is there some kind of digital enhancement, and so on? Yeah, they, they are. They are by necessity digitally created images because the detectors on Hubble. I mean, the cameras, the pictures you see on your iPhone, frankly, are the same. Um, you know, you're just getting, you're getting a radiance in each pixel on the detector, and that has to get yeah. assembled into an image uh, when the data come down to the ground. Um, the images that you see put out by the Hubble the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, they, they are colorized, and the Institute's very straightforward about this. They're not trying to hide anything. Um, but they, they do some color assignments to try to help to, to make it possible to visually appreciate detail, detail that's apparent in the data. But it's apparent in the data when you do a, a sophisticated analysis of the data, they're trying to make it, some of these features and differences apparent to the lay public like us, uh, who are just gonna look at the images and not manipulate the, the data itself. So there, no one's trying to colorize them just for the sake of making you know, dramatic CGI pictures. Okay. Hey, was there ever a film component? Like a, back in the day, no. it was... No, okay. never film. Uh, the, the, the original intention for the Hubble camera, the wide field planetary camera, was going to use a, a, a kind of detector called a, a, a video opticon, a bit opticon, uh, and charged couple devices were just becoming feasible as Hubble was being built. So one of the big uh, late last minute adaptations that was a controversy, it took weeks to sort out, was for the instrument designers making the camera to get permission to step up and step forward to charge a couple devices instead of those earlier detectors. But it was never optical. Okay, uh, we've got two more questions. Um, the next one goes to Paul. Paul, I'm going to open up your microphone and uh, Hopefully you've been muted. Hello. Hello, hello Paul. Paul. Hi, hello. Thanks for the talk. Um, this, uh, this, this might be a silly question, but I know that space is big, 
um, but we're sending an increasing amount of stuff up there. How do you how do you actually make sure that nothing gets in Hubble's way? Do you sort of book a do you sort of book an orbit? Yeah, great. It is a great question, uh, and and space at least near Earth space, let's say out to seven hundred fifty miles. Um, that is a very large volume, but it is not such a large volume that, that the debris problem uh, is, is not a concern. Um, in a nutshell, there are radar sensors on the ground operated by uh, several governments, notably the United States, that can track objects in orbit down to roughly the size of uh, something between a grapefruit and a soccer ball, a right. uh, football, as you would call it. Um, and there are, I think, something on the order of 20,000 of those. If you can track those objects, you know their mathematics well enough that you can predict whether they're going to get too close to any given object. So that's one way you do it with the big stuff, is you basically operate a collision warning system. Uh, Hubble is not very maneuverable at all, uh, so it's just going to sort of take what comes its way. Uh, the real problem with space debris is that there are there are millions, if not tens of millions, of objects and particles smaller than what I just said, all the way down to the size of a poppy seed. Uh, and it, it might sound kind of trivial to bump into a poppy seed or a blueberry in orbit, but at the speeds uh, at the speeds involved, if you were hit by a poppy seed, you would feel like someone had thrown a baseball at you at 90 miles an hour. And if you were hit by a blueberry, you would feel your blacksmith had dropped an anvil on your head. Uh, so, you know, something the size of an American um, baseball hitting you is would be like several hundred pounds of, of high explosive hitting you. So the stuff can be very damaging, even though it's very, very small. Thank you. Okay, uh, last question goes to Samira. So Samira, I'm gonna open up your mic again. Um, as an event organizer, it's always nice to get a great question to um, finish the talk on. They've all been great, but what sometimes questions are the sort of questions you want at the end of the Q&A, and this is one of those. Right, Samira. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Um, so, much. so the British... Are you there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Um, the British astronaut Helen Sharman, who I think went up to the space station in around 83, um, she said quite recently that she still dreams regularly about being in space. And I wonder if you do, and if you miss it. Yeah, uh, Helen flew to the Russian station, Mir, actually, not to the current Sorry. station. Um, yes, I do. I dream in zero gravity periodically. Uh, definitely so. Um, do I miss it? Uh, well, I. You know, we had what happened here in the United States some years ago was a former astronaut, John Glenn, who then been a senator for much of his career, at the age of 77, got to go back on a shuttle flight as a bit of a bit of a medical guinea pig, but um, had a great seven day mission in orbit. Uh, so I think you now you have one data point about how an old man's body responds to zero gravity exposure. Uh, I think you're going to need one older woman's uh, data point <laughs> as well. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm front of the line. I want the John Glenn deal. Hey, I, give me give me another 10 years I want the John Glenn deal absolutely but, but if but if they offered it to me tomorrow I would say yes in a heartbeat of course thank you so much thank you absolutely thank you Kathy that was a, a, a brilliant time hearing about your experiences and really inspiring um I think we may all be slightly dreaming in zero gravity after this so uh, thank you Scott, thank you much. I'm going to hop off for another call now. Absolutely. Have a good rest of the day and thank you. Um, there's lots of thanks coming in through the chat and thank you for your time. Yes. Well, thanks to all of you who joined. It was delightful talking with you.